everyone. Welcome back to the Climate Action Stage, curated by Kite Insights. We're going to get started again. The, uh, the program on uh, this afternoon's docket is Everybody's Business, How to Engage Suppliers for Transformation. And with us on stage are Bridget Beals, co-head of Climate Risk, KPMG, our moderator. Barry Parkin, Chief Procurement and Sustainability Officer for Mars. Ben Jordan, Supplier Sustainability for Coca-Cola. Katja Eisbrenner, Director, Energy, Sustainability and Infrastructure Guidehouse. And Michael Okora for Chief Sustainability Officer, McCormick and Company. Okay, Bridget, you're on. Super, thanks very much. Uh, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks very much for, for joining us yesterday for the panel. Um, on everybody's business, how to engage suppliers for transformation. And, and I think this title uh, is really apt because we've talked a long, for a long time about transitions and how do we transition the energy system, how do we transition to a low carbon economy. Uh, and I think the, the penny drop moment of going from intent to implementation is that this isn't about a transition, this is really about a transformation. So we're gonna have a really a great panel today um, bringing together all that thinking on you know, how do we really start to unlock that transformation uh, across our supply chains, which we increasingly understand to be incredibly complex, uh, systemically interlinked, uh, and hugely decentralized. So um, without further ado, we're gonna jump into the thick of it today. Um, the, the great cast here we have, uh, have been collaborating really effectively together over the last several years uh, around a coalition, uh, the Supplier Leadership on Climate Transition Coalition, uh, trying to bring you know, that collaboration to that scope three decarbonisation challenge. So to start off with Michael, maybe I'll turn to you. Could you just tell us a little bit about the coalition, um, what it is, what it's hoping to achieve and, and the progress you've made today? Thank you, Bridget, and uh, I'm Mike Okora for Chief Sustainability Officer at McCormick and Company. And for those of you who don't know McCormick, uh, he's the king of spices. And for those of you that know McCormick, you're all great cooks. <laughs> all right, so um, one of the things that uh, really started all of this is really the idea that we want to future-proof our business. And uh, we believe that this climate journey is really a pre-competitive space where we can all collaborate. I mean, the, the real concept of cooperation is what this is all about. But here's the business case. When you look at our businesses, the things we don't control, the scope three, is about 95% of our carbon footprint. And I will argue that for our partners, um, Mars, PepsiCo, Coca-Cola, it's, it's about the same thing. And so this is about uh, creating an enduring business. So we realize that in order to do this and do it as a scale, we have to convene as a company to collaborate and then bring in the suppliers. So that started with uh, McCormick, Mars, PepsiCo, and Coca-Cola, you know, convening this thing. And then today, we have about 20 other CPG companies that are part of this and over 500 suppliers because we just finished our, we're in our fourth season. We started this in April of last year. And the idea is you have to think about what McCormick introduced in 2017 before ESG became very popular. We call it our purpose-led performance, which is purely delivering top-tier financial performance while doing the right thing for our people, our communities, and the planet we share. Think about it. What have I just said? It's simply about doing well by doing good. And if you have to do that, since most of our crops come from what? The global south? Herbs and spices don't grow in Minnesota, so you know. So one of the things that became obvious is that we have to make sure that those communities can endure for us to have an enduring supply chain. Whether you are Mars or McCormick or Cook, it's really about creating an enduring supply chain, which is what we've done in this case. And that's why we came together. And our realization was that we were having the same problem. And in order to solve it, we have to collaborate. In fact, one of the concepts that came to me when we were talking about this with Mars initially and PepsiCo and, and Coke is the African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, 
go together. So that's the business case for this, because we all want to survive. We also want the, the communities where we do uh, a business with that produce our crops to survive. So that's where we came together, and that's the business case for what we're trying to talk about here. Thank you, Bridget. Super. That's, that's amazing, Michael. Thanks for sharing those thoughts. And uh, I totally agree. Um, collaboration between yourselves is hugely important, but, but also that collaboration with the supply chain as well. So, so maybe then I'll just turn to you, Kautia. Um, what, what's, the, what's the business case for engaging with that supply chain? Um, and why should companies actually engage beyond their direct value chain and, and into that sort of wider um, value chain? And when they do that, what are the outcomes that they, they should hope to achieve? Well, thanks very much. My name is Katja Eisplanner. I'm at Guidehouse and we're an international consultancy and we have, we have been working a lot with companies on the sustainability journey and that's also how it came together with the ASLOC team. So I think in 2019 when it was identified that the suppliers, which Michael just said, also need support in doing this because if you're a supplier, you're alone working with data and crunching numbers, greenhouse gas protocols, all of that, that's not a lot of fun to do alone. So I think that's also when the spirit of collaboration started, that when you do it together, uh, there is more motivation, there's more activities and more initiatives. So these first monthly sessions where all the brands came together, designed the program, what is now called supplier leadership on climate transition. And what it is doing, it's using existing material. So it's not was not the idea to start from scratch. So it's looking at uh, greenhouse gas protocol, science-based targets, and it's looking at helping the companies to look at the footprint, the target setting, the abatements, and also at the disclosure. So it's a whole journey. That's all is not new, that is existing. But what is new is on how to do it. And what was missing is a little bit, uh, yeah, to provide that space. And what does that look like? So it's first, it's a combination, it's a human instructed climate school, you can say, where the suppliers that the brands bring forward can participate in. And then also it's a 24 seven help desk. Because if you have a question on what you need to do with the accounting or an idea, and then you have to wait for three weeks until you get to that next class and you first maybe have forgotten the question or you think it's not as important and you look at something else. So I think that's what this Collaborate Safe is doing and also making it a bit easier, looking at uh, making the, if you're a sustainability officer or somebody working with the data and you have never looked at the greenhouse gas protocol before or what it means to set a science-based targets, you need to yeah, detangle that, make it a bit more digestible and accessible. And that's uh, what we have been doing together with the big brands. It's growing, exactly. There will be new brands actually announced to join this week. And uh, so far, there have been over 500 suppliers uh, engaged now in SLOCT in over 50 countries in the world and with more than 60% of those countries outside of the US. So that's also what Michael is saying. It's a truly global collaborative space. And that, I think, what is the success of it. And of course, we need more of it. Super. Thanks, Katja. Um, and in, in my experience, you know, it's, it's relatively straightforward for, for companies like McCormick, Mars, Coca-Cola to seek each other out. You know, I can pick up the phone, I can, I can talk to many of these large companies at any, any time I like, but, you know, from my experience, you know, some of uh, my clients have found it really difficult to engage down into the spice growers uh, in, in uh, the global south as well. So, should companies stop? at the largest 80% of that 95% footprint, or, or should they go beyond that? Um, Barry, I'd love to, to come to you for thoughts on that. Yeah, sure, and hi everybody, uh, it's Barry Parkin. I'm the uh, Head of Sustainability and Procurement at Mars. Um, and, you know, as you think about Mars, and I, th I, I hope everybody in the room knows our brands, um, probably just as much so as many as know uh, my colleague here from Coke, but, um, that, you know, we're here at the conference of the parties. Mars's footprint is the size of a, a small country. We often compare it with Panama to give you a sense of scale. So 30 million tons. So we're relevant. And, uh, but then you think about our footprint. 90% is embedded in the goods and services we buy. And a lot of that in raw materials. So if we're going to achieve our goals, net zero by 2050, we have to engage our suppliers. If their footprints don't change, our footprint doesn't change. Uh, it's really as simple as that. So this is a hugely important initiative. So where do you start? Well, we start with the big suppliers. And uh, we have 20,000 suppliers. 
Um, but if you look at the 100 with the biggest footprint, you get to sort of 70% of, uh, of, of our challenge. So there's a very strong uh, Pareto. Um, and we've done the work, we know the footprint of all of our suppliers. So it's quite easy to pick the ones that to start with. And, and the reason to start with the big ones, it, there's several reasons, but the, I think the first is, this is a race against time. And uh, we need to engage the biggest first to get them moving. Um, and uh, the start of that is on this journey to get them to, to measure their footprint, set targets and get moving. So unashamedly, we've started with the biggest suppliers. But, um, and, the, and the second reason is that uh, they, they're bigger, they've got a bigger profile, they're, bi they're big role models. So we want, uh, we want to see them moving uh, and encourage the rest of their sectors. And, and the third reason is that there's a cascade here. That's the beauty of this program. If we get our tier one suppliers moving, their footprints are in the tier two suppliers and the tier three suppliers, and they will get them moving. So there's a, there's a fantastic scaling opportunity here, which we're already seeing with 500 suppliers now moving on this. And you wait another year, that's just going to scale exponentially. So I think we have a fantastic vehicle here for, for getting our supply chains moving. Super, thanks, thanks so much. So, so we're applying the 80-20 rule, we're, we're delving into it. Uh, we're probably getting mixed responses, I imagine. Um, so, so maybe I'll come to you, Ben. Could you tell me a little bit about you know, some of the challenges and the limitations of that engagement? What's, what's your experience been and, and what's worked and what's not worked so well in that engagement process? Sure, absolutely. So just a quick little intro. So I'm Ben Jordan from the Coca-Cola Company. I work on our global policy and sustainability team and our global lead for uh, packaging and for climate. And for us, similar to, to uh, Mike and Barry, our uh, scope three carbon emissions are about 85 to 90% of our overall carbon footprint. Uh, so if you think about the, the big areas for us, it's coolers, so vending machines, coolers, found dispensers, that's about a third of our carbon footprint. Our packaging is about a third, and then ingredients in agriculture are about 15 to 20%. And so, um, you know, a lot of what we do with our World Without Waste program, which is our program for circular economy and packaging and use of recycled materials and recycling more, um, that has a direct impact um, on our, our carbon footprint. The most challenging area, I would say for us, just from a, a commodity and, and you know, contributing area for us, um, would be the agricultural side. And I know, you know, that's near and dear to, to both Mike and Barry and their businesses. You know, and that really is um, the challenging piece when you look at the fact that, you know, we don't buy directly from farmers. Um, we don't farm ourselves. We buy from companies that buy from farmers. There's as many as seven steps, even uh, for very unique um, things, um, different types of ingredients that we buy uh, between us and the farm. Um, so when you think about our specific influence all the way back to the farm, um, it's, it's not as, as large an influence as, as you would think, right? And so um, when you think about the fact that we're engaging those suppliers that are in between us and the farm, what we're really trying to do is build the capability there, right, that allows them to go and work um, upstream in their supply chains even better. Although we do engage often all the way to the farm level, much of that work, most of that work is through those um, supplier processing facilities. I would also say, you know, a big challenge for us when it comes to just the overall notion of, of supplier engagement is a balance between sort of mandates and requirements and then capability building, right? And, and how do you, you know, on the one hand, expect more and more of your suppliers, but know that not all your suppliers can deliver on that, so you need to, um, you know, work and, and help build their, um, build their capability. You know, in a global supply chain like ours, you know, we are as dependent on our suppliers in many cases as they are on us. Um, so we're at our best when we're engaging with all of our suppliers in a long-term journey you know, rather than saying, you know, putting um, strict mandates or requirements and trying to cut suppliers off, if you will, if they can't meet a requirement, we're really working to, to try and help um, lift the, the entire supply base so that they can all deliver. Super, thanks very much, Ben. And, and I imagine that a lot of your um, supply chain, the, the agricultural side's sort of potentially more in the global north. Um, I think that those challenges are probably uh, amplified when, when your spice traders are, are based out the global south. Maybe, could you share any reflections with us, Michael, on 
how you're engaging some of those challenges that you're facing as, as you sort of go into those more emerging markets. Yeah, and I think you called it out, and I agree with Ben with some of the issues, but for McCormick, it's actually a little more critical that you go straight to where you source. Um, so you know, I'll give you some examples. The number one producer of natural vanilla is which country? Madagascar. Yeah, there's a brilliant lady right there. And so the reason I say that is we're buying directly from them. And so one of the things to build on what Ben was talking about is that to have such communities thrive and to create an enduring supply chain, you have to invest in them. So we, in, when you talk about building resilience, because they don't have the capacity. I mean, let me give you a simple example. Something as simple as drip irrigation is a big deal for them because they are not used to doing that. So we have a team of agronomists that go out into the field to teach them those things, that one. The second thing is capital. Um, some of the problems we have is they don't have money to do the things we're asking them to do. And if, we, if they have to meet our standards, our sustainability standards, they have to do that. Give you one example of what we did. We partnered with IFC, part of the World Bank, for those of you who know, international uh, uh, organization, and uh, to provide village savings and loan to those communities that can't afford it. And you know what we did at McCormick? We paid the interest on those loans up front. And that allowed these women and men to pick up and start a new business, growing things in those farms, not just the uh, same thing with uh, black pepper. But at the end of the day, when they sell their crop, they pay back the loan without the interest. Today, when you go back, we started this before the pandemic. Today, when you go back, these communities are thriving. So this is really about our own in what I call enduring supply chain, our own livelihood, ensuring that we future-proof our business is what we're trying to do here. This is not philanthropy. So that's why I said we embedded it in a business uh, strategy we call purpose-led performance, which is what I mean when I started earlier by saying it's about doing well by doing good. Because if you don't allow those people to come up to speed and be able to provide for their families, make enough living, you're not going to have a business. And so that's the problem. This, the other point I wanted to make is, when you talk about carbon footprint, this is a nascent space. Most of these farmers have no clue what you're talking about. In fact, some of the big companies don't have any clue, some of our suppliers. So working with Guidehouse and with this team, we're training them on how to set, you know, what I call their uh, scope one, two, and three, and really map their strategy along that. I mean, for crying out loud, we just got our SBTI uh, uh, near term uh, uh, certification in August. And we're a big company. Now, think about the other smaller companies. It's even more challenging. So that's why investing, like we're doing with Mars, with Coca Cola, with PepsiCo, to really bring them along is actually future proofing our business and creating an enduring supply chain. That's one of the things we're doing. Super. Well, thanks, Michael. And and I think that's really apt because I know this coalition is, is really about supply chain decarbonisation, but, but obviously across the wider uh, sort of COP event over the next two weeks, uh, that just transition uh, and that mitigation and adaptation, those themes uh, are really prevalent. So how do we get that balanced scorecard um, to make sure we get that supplier diversity, to make sure we bring the Global South on this journey is, is incredibly pertinent. So it's, it's fantastic what, what you and the team are doing. Um, Maybe, maybe just looking forward then, um, you know, Michael's talked about having an SBT, I, I know you guys have, have those as well, huge amount of engagement, action, um, you know, we've learned some lessons along the way, probably particularly around the availability of data and the willingness to engage. Um, what's the next steps that, that you're going to take to, to start to, to shift the style forward and, and really start to implement or deliver uh, on that transformation? So, Ben, um, uh, sorry, Mike, uh, where am I going? I'm going to Katya first. Yeah, so I think what we have seen, and that's a little bit from the results, so you start with scope one and two, and that's first the first step, and then you look at scope three of these suppliers, and then you see how that transforms. So you go to the next step, and what we have built the, the S-Log in the way that you can 
you don't have to do everything at once. Because if you look at the big pile, the huge mountain to climb, you maybe not even dare to start. So it's broken down. You start with scope one and two, then scope three, then you set the targets, then you come with the abatement roadmaps and projects that you implement, and then the disclosure. And what we saw first is that the companies do start with the first batches and they come back. So I think that's, and maybe that's what the companies can also hear the brands confirm. Um, it's proven that it works, the step-by-step -step approach. And I think that's, um, of course, what to continue. And I think the other element, if you already establish these connections by the suppliers, it will not stop with s -Log. I mean, you, you build new relationships. It's all about people. You have trust. You build that platform where people can exchange. So it can also be used and naturally will help other elements in the community and elements to continue forward. So I think that's a natural effect that will happen on the sideline. Maybe I'll stop here. Perfect. And, and Barry, maybe I'll come to you next. What's, what's the next steps that, that Miles are taking and, and what can the audience learn from, from what you're doing? Yeah, and I think the, um, the phrase we're now using uh, internally is, is being a one and a half degree company. And um, what that means for us is, first of all, that we've set the right target, uh, the right net zero target. Um, but secondly, that we've, we've peaked emissions. So we peaked emissions in 2018, and we've, we've now demonstrated that we can separate growth from, um, from emissions. So we've grown 28% um, since we set our target, and uh, we've reduced our footprint by 6%. So it's a good start. It's more like a two degree trajectory. We're going to get it to a one and a half degree trajectory. Um, and that means we've got to, we've got to frankly sort of halve our footprint by 2030 while we continue to grow the business. So we've got to accelerate. And uh, that's the commitment because the phrase we use internally is it's the area under the curve that matters. There's no point doing this and then some miracle at the end. We've got to do this. And uh, we, that's what we're measuring ourselves on. So how are we doing that? We're, we're engaging the whole business. We, in the last month, we've spent a couple of days with, our, with the board. We've spent uh, a day with our top 150 talking about this. Um, we've linked it into executive remuneration um, at a level where the general managers and regional presidents are coming to us and saying, OK, this is a big enough number now. Um, what do I need to know? What do I need to do? How do I do this? So we're engaging the whole organization in this, and, uh, and that's allowing us to accelerate. We know what we've got to do. We've got to do renewable energy. We've got to do packaging. We've got to do logistics. We've got to change some recipes. Um, and we've got to do climate smart agriculture. Um, and we've got to uh, manage land use. And so we talk about six big bets. Uh, we have plans on all of them. We've just done an exercise where we looked at 500 strategies uh, that would uh, uh, potentially halve our footprint by 2030. We know what the cost is. We know uh, how difficult they are. We know how to do them. So um, we, we're treating this like a business problem. And, uh, and that is the key. And uh, uh, if we do that, then we'll get it done. So that's the plan. And it's fantastic. You've got so much senior level engagement, Mary. How would you advise others who are struggling to get that, that buy-in, who haven't managed to get the board away for a few days, who haven't got that commitment to the, the remuneration targets, what, what's the one piece of advice you'd give the audience um, if they're struggling to do that, to, to try and garner that support? You need to get a great CEO to start with, and we have our uh, outgoing CEO in the audience here, so he's been pivotal of both engaging up, <laughs> Grant Reid. <laughs> um, He's been pivotal at uh, engaging up the organization, but also down. You, you've got to get your owners and your board on board. Um, you know, we, we didn't set our, our net zero target in the first wave here. We only set it a year ago. And that's because it was a serious conversation with the board. It wasn't a, oh, we need to do this. It was, what's it going to cost? How are you going to get there? Uh, we're only going to set the target if you show us a plan uh, of how you're going to get there. So we spent probably three board meetings talking about the how and what it would cost before they said go. Uh, and, and then it's fully committed. So you've got to got to engage your board and your owners. Mm -hmm. thank, thank, Michael, I think you, sure. you've, you've got something to yeah, share. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I, just, I just couldn't help it. What Barry said resonates. You can't get this done with hope. Hope is not a strategy. You need a CEO that is committed. In our own case at McCormick, 
Lawrence Cosius, our chairman and CEO, was committed from day one when we actually started the proposed lead performance strategy. You know what he told us? Uh, there were two of us that came up with the strategy. He said, make sure whatever you do, align it with the 17 SDGs. That was it. And he was serious. And this is what he's telling the board. We have to align everything we do to the SDGs. And today, McCormick is tracking on 13 out of the 17 SDGs that are pertinent to us. But here's another thing. He said, you have to embed it in business strategy. You cannot decouple it from the business strategy. So if you're looking to start, make sure you make that business case. And Barry talked about uh, packaging, you know, our energy purchases. This is not about trying to fill a gap. This is how we're doing things. I'm pleased to say we just opened our first net zero plant in Peterborough, UK, this summer. Net zero in construction, net zero in operation. And just this month, this is still uh, uh, early this month, we opened up the first, our largest distribution center in Baltimore. It's all powered by on-site solar. The building is half a mile long and a quarter of a mile wide. And what I'm talking about is the on-site solar will generate what? Only 20% of what we're going to need is generated. 80% we're giving back to the grid so that the communities that can't afford it can benefit from that. And I'm really uh, glad to say that type of thing doesn't happen if you don't have the board, the CEO, supporting it all the way. T totally agree. Um, so coming back over to you, Ben, um, we great to hear about the Coca-Cola experience, you know, what's worked, what's not worked, and, and what's next for you. Sure, just wanted to make a quick build on some of the senior leadership engagement piece, if that's okay. I absolutely agree with everything that Mike and Barry have said, and you know, CEO engagement is absolutely critical, board engagement as well. I would say that one new dimension that has come on in the last couple of years is just the way the mainstream investor community has engaged on ESG issues, and that's driving so much, um, both in terms of you know, just treatment on the issues, but all the, uh, the aspects around um, risk, identification, and disclosure. And that's equipping us as sustainability professionals in companies with more and more tools to be able to make those business cases to our senior leadership. And they hear it in a different way when they know that it's investor driven. I think that's something we can all, all relate to, right? Um, the climate risk assessment helps us to, to link change to financial value. So I think for, for a lot of companies, that's really what's getting the CEOs, the board members, et cetera, to, to really sit up and take notice. And, helping to drive that attention and, and consequently that change. So I think it's a, it's a great point, Ben. Um, I don't know if there was anything you wanted to add on kind of some of the, the challenges of, of, of the sort of scope three implementation and, and where next for Coca-Cola? So for us, there's sort of a strategy um, of efforts around specific uh, areas of, of um, carbon footprint. So if you think about the coolers, the cold drink equipment that I mentioned, specific innovation initiatives there, we're in the process of releasing new guidelines um, for our equipment now to 2030. What type of equipment do, do we need to be purchasing um, now and into the future to be able to hit our long-term targets on packaging? I mentioned our World Without Waste plan, which has 2025 and 2030 targets around the use of recycled materials, more sustainable packaging, recycling more packaging, using more reusable packaging. And so a big piece of innovation and push there around suppliers um, of, of packaging. And then the agricultural piece where we have our principles for sustainable agriculture and are, are um, driving um, better environmental and social practices upstream in agriculture. So that's the sort of the, the specific work um, within each category area. But then the cross-cutting piece, you know, and we, we talk about SLOC, but another couple of, of efforts that I'll mention for us, um, CDP, so formerly Carbon Disclosure Project, um, we're involved in the CDP supply chain project and invite 450 of our largest suppliers around the world to report um, through that. Most of them do. And um, along with that and the SLOC program, we're tracking about five or 600 suppliers uh, in terms of their long-term commitments around um, SPT and, and carbon footprint. We're also engaging more and more on supplier-specific emission factors, you know, as we get beyond using industry average data for so much of the, the upstream, um, you know, data and information. Uh, and so as part of that program, what we're doing is identifying leading suppliers within each category area and really learning ourselves from those leading suppliers, but also to Barry's point earlier, you know, as suppliers as role models, 
how can we take what the leading suppliers are doing and help spread that across the category and commodity areas? Fantastic. And, and then finally to, to you, Katya, I know you're working with a number of clients across the space. Maybe any reflections from you on, on lessons the audience should learn from you know, the, the scars on the back, so to speak? Yeah, thanks. I think one of the elements that we saw is the speed of implementation that the collaboration allows. And I mean, it's one of what the COP presidency also said, it's collaboration is key and that's increasing the speed. And it's also then, I think, together, the, the commitment of the brand showing the leadership also the, to the suppliers that trickles down. And that has what we see in the first time has increased between six to 12 months, where it before took years. Of course, that's not all to ASLOC. That also has to do with the time is the right time. It, things have changed, there's more commitment, it has more attention, but I think the speed is really important here and allows then also yeah, to speed up and meet the scale that we were all talking about today. Thanks, Katja. Now I'm going to come to the audience for questions uh, in a minute, so think of uh, all your best ones. Uh, whilst we wait to do that, I'm going to ask a question to the panel. Um, we hear a lot about the energy transition and undoubtedly uh, transposing our you know, fossil fuel based energy systems with renewables is critical to unlocking that one and a half degrees ambition but every one of you has talked about the need for an agricultural transition as well and I don't think that transition gets the airtime uh, that it needs so um, open question for whoever wants to take it but uh, if there was one thing that COP could deliver on agriculture um, then what would it be and, and how would it change things? So. Got a quick hand up there. It was a good question, obviously. Yeah, no, this is a this is a topic we've been working hard, and uh, in fact, tomorrow the uh, Sustainable Markets Initiative under now um, King Charles um, will be presenting its report on uh, on what we've learned about regenerative agriculture, and and the first thing we learned was it's not scaling. Um, so global cropland about 10 to 15 percent is now regenerative. Um, but it's, it's scaling hardly at all. So the early adopters have adopted and, uh, and there are, there's a problem. And that problem is financial incentives. So what do, we, what do we need from COP? We need government policy that's friendly to regenerative agriculture. Some of it is unfriendly. You get incentivized for not doing it. Um, uh, and some of it is relatively friendly. But we need all governments to incentivize climate smart, regenerative agriculture. Um, that, that, that's helpful, but we're also going to need ourselves to incentivize as well. So it needs to be a combination of supply chain incentives and government incentives to get this moving again. You know, it's not scaling fast enough, so it's a, it's a huge problem. And, and I agree with uh, Barry. Um, you know, it's not just um, about scaling the way we want it to do. There are also the regulatory landscape that needs to change to really advance that. But here are some of the things that, that we're doing because we've adopted these regenerative farming processes across the board. But you can't implement it at the same time. You have to go sector by sector. So at McCormick, one of the things we did, we identified what we call our five iconic crops. These are the crops that make the most money for us. They are black pepper, red pepper, oregano, cinnamon, and vanilla. And I end up with vanilla because that brings us back to Madagascar. And now, one of the things that people don't realize is that vanilla is actually an orchid. And if you're an agronomist, you know, you need an orchid. You need a host plant for an orchid, right? And there's nothing more regenerative than vanilla if done the way we're doing it now. And that's what we have to teach the, uh, the, the farmers. And so it's simple that you don't disrupt the soil when you stick an orchid to the ground. Even I planted one when I was in Madagascar, and I hope it's growing. It hasn't died yet. And you need a host plant. And what is the largest carbon sink we know today in the world? Natural carbon sink. Trees. So you've got something that doesn't disrupt the soil. And you've got a tree that is sinking carbon for you. That's a good way to really talk about regenerative examples. So we started there, and today these communities are thriving. They don't disrupt the soil. In fact, we are enabling them to conserve some areas where we are planting trees. And by the way, when you're doing the right thing, USAID noticed their partners with us. IDH uh, in, in uh, Netherlands is a partner with us. GIZ in Germany is a partner with us on this journey. Why am I saying this? 
the, this issue of collaboration, this issue of partnership is critical to what we're driving. And what we're finding is we can now scale by leveraging all these resources because the communities that we're talking about in the global south, they don't have the money to do these things. Uh, you know, and by the way, they contributed only, the whole of Africa, for instance, contributed only 4% of the problem we have today with climate action, right? And now we're asking them to bear the brunt. That's unfair. So we're doing something about it, and thank goodness some of the agencies are supporting that as well, so that our money is being amplified to a significant extent. Great. Thank, thanks very much both. That's super helpful. Did we have any... Yes, we've got a question uh, over at the back there. Hi, um, my name is <coughs> Yuito Yamada from Tokyo. Thanks for the great talk. And maybe first a question to Barry, um, if I may. Love to hear, we talked a bit about the suppliers, how the consumers are starting to react um, in terms of the initiatives that you're doing, sustainable packaged goods, what has worked versus what hasn't worked? You know, when you changed the prices, they made it higher, it didn't work, or when the prices were the same, the consumer reacted positively. Love to hear some experiences on the consumer side as well. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, frankly, it's hard work. We have, we've all been experimenting how to engage consumers with various sustainability initiatives. And, and you know, it's more, it's more failures than successes. It's interesting. The, the most successful um, activation with customers, consumers we've had has been around coral reefs. Um, so we've got this fantastic program around our Sheba brand, cat food brand, um, where the, the origins of the, uh, the raw materials, the, the fish, come from coral reefs. So we've, we've got the biggest coral reef restoration project in the world, which is a bit strange for Mars. But, uh, um, and when we've, in, when we've engaged customers and consumers in every country, it's been grown share, it's grown sales, it's grown awareness of the brand. So it, it's, I, I use that just to illustrate it's not the obvious answer. You've got to find something that connects with consumers. Um, and, uh, and that's what we're all trying to do. It's interesting when, when we, you know, when I talked earlier about engaging with the board and, um, you know, what's it going to cost? We assumed we would get no return from the, 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 the consumer. Um, we're hoping we will. But, um, and the answer to that question was, frankly, we can afford to do it anyway. Um, but of course, we want to get a competitive advantage from the consumer and the customer. So we, we continue to try and find the best ways to do that. It's not easy. Got a yeah, uh, question? I think it's me. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm Tisha Livingston with 80 Acres Farms from the US. A couple questions. One, um, when you, are you willing to pay your suppliers more money uh, if they're good players within the market and, uh, and doing things in a sustainable way? And then also, uh, are you willing or looking at disrupting your supply chains in the transportation because that's a significant part of the carbon footprint story? Uh, and finally, have you looked at alternate farming to be able to bring production closer to manufacturing facilities? Yeah, do, you, do you want me to start with uh, paying our farmers uh, more? And the answer is yes. Let me give you a specific example. It's easy to answer something without the example, but I'm gonna give you a specific example. In Madagascar, um, the vanilla farmers, we committed to paying them more <clears throat> if they will produce things based on what we call grown for good. It's the first in our industry, in the herbs and spices industry. It's a McCormick framework that allows you not just to adhere to what I call farm level certification, like with Rainforest Alliance, uh, we, they are our partner, by the way, but to make sure we're building healthy communities. <clears throat> where we have one, uh, building resilience in those communities with capacity and capability. Two, women empowerment, because we want women to own a lot more of the farms, because historically they haven't. And three, ethical supply chain, where we are, there is no time for forced, le uh, forced labor or any kind of thing. So we committed to paying them more. But the question is, how do you do that? <clears throat> Excuse me. You have to understand how our businesses go. In the agricultural communities, every farmer sells to a middleman in the village. So you have like a thousand farmers in one village, they sell to a middleman. That middleman sells to another middleman in a bigger city, who now sells to our export partner. By the time you, all this is done, these farmers are impoverished. And these middlemen, and I say middlemen because I grew up in one of those communities and they're all men. 
And these middlemen are driving Mercedes Benz and fancy cars, and these farmers are impoverished. Guess what we did? We eliminated middlemen in our supply chain. And the farmers grow the crop they sell to us. We commit to pay them a premium, yes. But guess what? After you eliminate the middlemen, there's just too much money to share. So you got to be smart. You want to talk about innovation. That's the kind of innovation we're bringing to it. And we're seeing these communities, these farmers flourish. These women that are starting farms are now sending their kids to private school, similar to the one I went to, growing up in a farming community in the eastern part of Nigeria. And I'm telling you, it works. And that's part of the thing that we're bringing to the equation. And that's how we're doing it. Yes, we're paying them more, but it doesn't necessarily mean it will cost us more. Great. Thanks, Michael. And I think we've got time for just one more question uh, at the back. Yes. Hi, wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Ira from the UK Transition Plan Task Force. And we're really grappling with the question about what a good gold standard transition plan is and what disclosures around transition plans are needed to kind of ensure credibility and accountability. Um, on this point of engagement strategy, I have two related questions. The first one is, how can you distinguish a good engagement strategy from a bad one if you're looking, trying to compare ambition across companies? And then the second one, if you're kind of talking to your suppliers, what information about their strategies would you like to see public in transition plan disclosures to allow you to assess the credibility of their ambition and action? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to kick off on that. I think the, the key thought here is we need to move beyond commitments and plans to performance. It's time. So, you know, we, this initiative we're talking about here is about getting people started and commitments and whatever. But we need to be tracking performance. Um, you need to know what Mars's annual reduction is. What is their reduction since inception? You need to know what every company's line is. What is that line? Are they on this line, this line, this line, or this line? This is the one and a half degree line. Um, so I, that's, it's really as simple as that. We've got to stop just talking about commitments and plans. And I, I encourage everybody in the room to work out how we're going to get transparency of real performance soon. Well said, Barry. I can tell you the time for talking is over. Now is execution. Completely agree. Super. Thanks very much, everybody. Uh, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'll leave you with just four key thoughts uh, from our panelists that they've shared over the last sort of 45 minutes or so. Uh, number one, it's time. And number two, it's about co-opetition. Number three, it's about engagement. Uh, and finally, it's about actual performance. So thank you very much, everybody. Really appreciate your insights. Uh, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>